Yeah. Welcome everyone to uh, this week's uh, lecture. We have the illustrious Mike Morris, who will be talking to us about not only life as a farmer, but animal welfare. Thank you all for coming. Well, then they housed all winter. And that was the conventional way. It is changed. Now we can also introduce a New Zealand style way of milking where the cows are kept out on grass as much as possible. So they're only housed, say, four months of the year instead of six. But then your production per cow is down to between four and a half and five gallons. If I speak in gallons, are you all right? Okay. Um, the conventional way in the winter for six months, out on grass for six months, you will get up to seven gallons per cow. The New Zealand style is you're feeding grass, mainly 95% grass and very little bought in feed. And a lot of it then they change in now, they go block calving. They like to calve between middle of February and end of March. And the cows will milk for 10 months of the year. That is the ideal. Have two months rest, and then they carve again and they start again. And the cow will give a maximum milk production in his first 100 days, or when it gets in calf, it'll start to tailing off. The problem is also you've got the high pedigree boys. Well, they'll probably keep the cows in longer on the winter spell, and they feed a lot of bought in feed. They will have anywhere between eight and 10 gallons of milk from a cow per day on that 100 days, but they are put in 40% bought in feed. So then you're looking at margins and it's different. The fourth method now, which is getting very, very popular, the cows are kept in 24 seven, 365 days of the year. And if any of you, one or two of you came to me on the walk, I done down, <clears throat> excuse me, in my dream on a farm down there. And I explained how critical it was to have good airflow and you treat the cows like a baby. You keep them clean, dry, well-fed and well aired. And the air circulation in these sheds and the cleanliness is paramount. If you keep any calves, shall we say, from two weeks to, to nine months in a shed with adult cattle, I'll guarantee you within 48 hours, they will have pneumonia. So there is a lot to it on the animal husbandry side. And we have found if you've got a good system, good tracks, good fencing, and you keep your feed constant, good constant, keep them dry and well bedded down and look after them, you will get 5% extra gross margin. But no extra work but by just having a good routine. And now this, keeping the cows in all the year round is causing problems in its own. You've seen on the television recently these fattening uh, corrals out in America where they've got 10,000 you know, in different corrals going down like a motorway. They are poisoning the soil, polluting the water, and causing other problems. And now they're saying methane from the animals is affecting the climate, the climate change. The, more, the most uh, that anybody is milking in this area is 3,000 cows. That's three miles west of Camarthen. And he's carrying silage and feed in from as far as way of 10 years and dialogue. Um, it's causing a problem because he's too near built up areas. But that's the modern way. And I'll come to that when I come on to milk pricing and the way the family farm is being squeezed out of business. So basically, that's it on the milking. Any questions? No? Right. I mentioned last time in the late 50s, in the 50s, the milk marketing board was set up by the government 
to buy all the dairy farmers' milk in this country. Before then, it was hard going. And, and in 1960, a loaf of bread, a pint of milk, and a pint of beer was the same price. Today, a pint of beer will cost you, well, I don't know, I don't really drink, three to four pounds. Loaf of bread will cost you one pound something. And a, and a litre of milk, which is 1.6 of a pint, no, the other way around, will cost you, what, 50 pence? I was getting 22.4 pence in 1984. The farmers are getting anywhere now between 27 and 31 pence per litre of milk. And I'll come on to that now. And the problem, there's not enough margin. The cost of production per litre is anywhere between 21 and 25 pence a litre, depending how good you are and other varying factors. And any business relies on, if you've got low borrowing, same as most of us now in our old age, we've got mortgage-free housing. Totally different than having a mortgage, isn't it? So the costs are so tight. 1964, my father was milking, what, 18 cows? Had a few uh, store cattle, beef cattle, and he was making a living. Not a big living, but he was making a living. Now, when we, if we were milking 140 cows now, it wouldn't be enough. So the MMB was running well. It wasn't ideal, it had problems, but it, it done the job. In the 80s, the supermarkets started coming into their buying power. They had a lot of buying power. And the story goes, there's a gentleman in the Gower growing carrots and supplying them to Tesco. And what I'm going to say is my own opinion, okay? Now, he had a contract to supply carrots to Tesco, and they had to be between six and eight inches long. Ten days before he was due to harvest them, he had a phone call, oh, we can't take them now, we don't need them for a while, we'll get in touch. When Tesco then got in touch with the farmer, the carrots kept growing. So when they said, yes, we can take them now, and he started uh, lifting them, they were 10 inches long. So Tesco turned around, I'm sorry, six to eight inches, so he had to plow them all in. That's an example of what the supermarkets are doing. And if you look, where is the milk, the milk products? They're all on the far side of the supermarket. And you are like, I suppose I'm the same. I go in, I want to find the milk. Time I get there, I've got half a dozen other things in my trolley. It's also a sales way of selling. You need your essentials, so put them at the far end. So you've got to go through the supermarket. So it's all selling to me. So anyway, come the 90s, there was so much pressure put on, the government got rid of the milk marketing board. And I was involved then. We had about 35 farmers, you know, in the area where I was farming in Ponte de Lais. Some a lot bigger than me and some a lot smaller. And we formed a buy-in group. And we had to look who would give us our best price, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we went with Unigate. And they wanted high protein, high fat. Of course, if you got high protein and high fat, generally your milk volume will be less. A Jersey cow and a Guernsey cow will give you anywhere between five, four and a half and six percent fat. Go up to 4.5% uh, protein, but you'll only get four gallons out of them. A whole strain cow will do anything between 8 and 10 gallons a day, but you'll have 3% protein and about 3.5% fat. So it's the other, and then you've got the British Frisian, which is in between, a bit better on the fat and protein, and a bit better milk production. Now, and we had a, we didn't have a pedigree herd. We had a very well mixed herd. I had the odd pedigree that I bought. But I had brown Swiss, MRI, which was a moose, Rhine, Rhine Issel, which is on the confluence of three rivers in Holland. We had British Frisian, we had cross Jerseys, I had Holstein, I had cross Shorton, 
So we were pushing for the fast and the protein. And with a decent milk production. So anyway, we joined with you, Miguel. And the milk price went up to 29 pence a litre. And we were told by the gentleman we were representing you, Miguel. He said, look, whatever you do, don't go buy a new tractor with the margin you're making. You reduce your borrowing. He knew what was coming. We were a bit naive. And within, what, 10 months, that price had dropped down to 14 pence. Because all the milk buyers, once the MMP was got rid of, they had their volume from the farmers and they picked up points. So once they had the volume, they dropped the price. And 14 pence was ridiculous. It didn't come down in the shops, mind. So the MMP, that was missing. If you go in Canada, each state, has got a milk uh, production to suit their needs for each state. But in 1997, we were looking to emigrate out to Canada and I bought two farms out there and seen the accountant, the bank manager and everybody else. And I had a buyer for my farm. And unfortunately, you've got uh, about five months or six months to get your to buy and to get over there to the farm. About six weeks before we were just going to order the container, the chap by in my farm and his father-in-law was in, in the deal with him, came down and said, I can only pay you for half the farm. My father-in-law father has dropped out. And I said, well, that's no good to me. So I put me and Marion and uh, my middle son and his wife and child through the immigration, the medicals and blah, 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 everything else. So anyway, we never went to Canada, but that's destiny for you. But what we saw out there was very interesting. And things have changed. So with the demise of the MMP, the processing boys, are more or less what's happened now in this last 12 months with the reduction in milk use, they've been turning to the farmers and say you've got five, 6,000 litres in the tank. They'll come and they say, we'll only take 2,000 off you today, you throw the rest on the grave. And there's nothing you can do about it. So that's the problem now with the dairy. And the supermarkets have so much buying power, the processors want their margin, and the farmers aren't working in a block to fight for themselves. When you only get um, finished, I joined the uh, dairy farmers of Great Britain. So they were going to look as a, for a cooperative for buying the, the farmer's milk and selling it as a cooperative. And they were looking to go into high liquid milk and high margin. But they went under because the business side of it fell apart. And anyway, it wasn't long after I sold the farm with Marion at serious ill health. So that's the problem with milk. We're only about 70% self-sufficient in this country. You have a load of exports coming in. There's no help for the business on that side in agriculture. Nobody's looked at it seriously for 40 years. You take Southern Ireland. 95% of what they produce is exported. They only use 5% for home use themselves. The rest is exported. You know, there's world round carry gold, this world now renowned um, butter on that. There's nothing in this country. So that is the problem on the milk side. Is, and the price is being squeezed. The two biggest costs in dairy, the one is the labor cost, two is the replacement cost for your milking cow, where you Put the cow, the milking cow in calf, to place a half a calf, you rear your half a calf because you picked your best cow. Today, there's embryo transplant, there's sex semen, where you can get a female, 95% guaranteed, guaranteed to be a, car, a female calf. And those are the problems. The farmers don't work together and, and they haven't got a voice. You see advertising for all nonsense on the television. But there's nobody selling British produce. 
And I'll come on what's in food today, welfare standards, and I mention welfare standards now. They are the highest in the world. And I'll come to that, but that's a different subject in a minute. So that's the problem with British farms, dairy. The small farms are being squeezed out, the margins aren't there, the processors don't want to pick up small quantities of milk anymore. When the MMB was running, one tanker went down the road and picked every farm left and right of that road until he was full. Another tanker came along and picked the rest up. Today, you've actually got six or seven tankers going down one road picking one farm up. And you talk about the carbon footprint. So the, the farmers have got the problem. And I said, I'd rather spend money and pay a thousand pounds and get somebody like Alan Sugar, it's only an um, imaginary figure, Alan Sugar, to be the, be the voice of British agriculture. You've got the NFU, National Farmers Union, you've got the National Farmers of Wales, you've got the smallholders, landowners, small landowners. But they can't cover all aspects. They can't cover horticulture, sheep, beef, dairy, and everything else. So you need a voice for dairy. And milk is important for the children. We're the only adult animals in the world who drink milk. You know, every other thing, once the, the bird or the, or the baby has been, you know, brought to win, you know, they're on their own. Well, we drink a lot of milk. And another subject is what's in milk. It's less than 4% fat, well, 3.1, 3.2% protein that you drink. All of us about fat and everything, how much milk you drink? Not a lot. School meals, there's a free school meals today. I've asked one or two people, and they say no, because we haven't got kids now, so we don't know. And I'm out of it a bit. The processing people don't want free school milks anymore. Supermarkets don't want it, because there's a large percentage less bought through the supermarket if you put free school milks back. So it's a vicious circle. So any question? They are talking, it was on the news the other day, they've got, to, they've got to produce more in Wales, in the UK. And it's not going to happen unless somebody grabs it by the hair and sorts it out. And to do that, you've got to make a fuss. And the farmers won't make a fuss. And what you're going to end up happening is you will have large farms, the milking cows kept in 24-7, 365 days a year. And the smaller farms will either be bought up, the family farms around them, and they'll be feeding that one big farm. So that is a problem that's going to come. And the other problem is when you're driving down country roads in the summer, your windows open and all of a sudden you close it in a hurry. Because there's a funny smell around the place. They put the slurry out. Can you imagine how much slurry 3,000 cows produce? And all this rain we're getting now, if it's not contained properly, they're trying to put grants in, small grants, so you cover the yards, so the dirty water doesn't run off. It's contained. Yeah, but they're 30 years too late. A lot of farmers have done it, man. There's a lot haven't. So that is the problem. So it's an ongoing problem, and as I'm saying, with the family farm, we, me and Marion and the family, we didn't have holidays away. Because if it costs 500 pounds for a holiday, so we say to go anywhere abroad or wherever you wanted to go, it'll cost you an extra 500 pounds to find somebody to do your job. And to find somebody who's reliable is difficult. Me and Marion and a couple of friends, we went up to North Wales for the weekend. I milked on the Friday night and we shot off with our friend. And I'd made arrangements for uh, this other chap he was going to come in to milk. And I had a phone call then, half past five in the morning, from one of my sons. Your milkman hasn't turned up. He's got the flu. 
So I turned around and came home. One of the boys milked the cows before he went to work. So I wasn't very pleased. And the only time you don't turn up if you're a relief milker, you're either dead or you've broken your leg. So those cows have got to be milked. And if they're high producing animals, you don't know if you've noticed, but there's a strain on it. So the milking cow works very, very hard. And it's got to be looked after. And they like pets, a lot of them. You know, you, you see me saying one thing, I put that uh, TikTok on the hill to year, and somebody said it was cool when this chap lifted the tail and kicked him in the backside and he shot up the lorry. Well, it's better than a stick. That animal had a fright. That's why it shot forward, not that it was hurt. It's better than a stick. And I've even seen you even get these sticks now that are electrified with a battery. So if you touch an animal, an animal it gets a shock. Yeah. But then yeah, that goes back to the way you farm. We're all different. And I'm a big believer, if your sons stay home, they will only learn as much as you, unless they are exceptionally different. So as far as I'm concerned, when the kids come 16, 17, they come out of the house for two years. Go and, go and work somewhere 200 miles away so you can't bring your washing on. And then you will start growing up and take responsibility. So there's a lot to it. I'll get on to animal welfare in a minute. Any questions? No? Right, good. Let's change the subject a bit. Uh, as a family, we were loud, noisy. I had three, we had three boys. And when the boys were five or six, Marion said, I'm sure there's something wrong with our boy. So she, had, she was one of three uh, sisters. I said, no, they are boys. And boys, as far as I'm concerned, they get up to mischief. Hope to God they stay safe. And that's how they, they develop themselves and a personality and learn. You know, we had quite a few odd moments. But I think the children have got uh, following their mother, you know, a bit noisy and rampant and up to no good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Our middle son, he was what, six when we lost him in some window? He was six or seven. And I bought a 35-acre small holding when I was working with the poultry industry. And there was a well down on a pump house in one of the fields. So I went down to have a look, and the boys followed you. Following day, the middle one went missing. Of course, my biggest concern was that he'd gone down to this blinking well, and something had happened to him. But thank God, no, everything was right down there. So anyway, Marion phoned the neighbors out around. They all came out looking for him. We must have spent over an hour looking for him, couldn't find him. And in the loft of one of the outhouses, one of the sheds, we had a bit of storage there and we had a rolled up carpet. And the little monkey had crawled in there and gone to sleep. But we found him and he was safe. Because they were three boys and boisterous, we had a cow, I bought a cow in Cardigan, it was worth £540 at the time. And she was deep bodied, good milker, and a lovely, lovely temperament. And they called her Dopey, which was unfair because she wasn't Dopey, she was just a lovely cow. And they got in the habit of jumping on her back after milking to ride her out to the field. And I wish I'd taken a photograph of it, but we never did. The other funny moments are, I, we had a lot of rats on the last place we had, and that was 240 acres. It was a um, rundown, there was a dirty so-and-so who had it before, so the rats came and had a good time there. So anyway, I called in the pest control from the council in those days to help get rid of them. Because unfortunately, I put rat poison down in one, on one farm we had, and I killed my best sheep dog. He got, got hold of the poison. But I learned from that. Anyway, I was taking a bull shed down on a pen. I wanted to put it for the contain slurry from the parlor washing and the yard. And our youngest then was about 14. 
Alan. So I gave him a heavy bit of stick and I knew the rats were under the slate. So I said, when I lift the slate up now and the rat jumps out, you whack it one. So there he was, stick ready. I lifted the slate, the rat shot out, nothing happened. So I turned around, there Alan was running helpful leather across the yard and the rat the yard behind him. Well, we laughed. The other, uh, it wasn't, it was a funny moment for me, but not for Susie, my dog. And we were big pals. She was a lovely, lovely sheepdog, good working. And if she wasn't with me, I knew the grandchildren came. But she loved the kids. They jump on her, ride her, pull her ears, but she never stopped or growled. And when she had enough, she'd come back to me. Anyway, I don't know if you know, in a silage shed where you bring the grass in and you compact it, it's called silage. And the face of that then was with us was about five, six meters tall. The cows were fed outside in rings. Also, they fed up the face with electric fence in front of the silage field. The trouble is they could only reach six or seven feet high. So every two or three days, you had to go up and fork down the silage. Otherwise, they'd undermine the face and the top would fall down on them, pin them to the ground and suffocate them. It has happened, but not with us. So I jump up with a fork and start cleaning the face off to square it off, and Susie would be with me, the dog. When I finished, I jumped down, went under the bar, under the electric fence wire. Susie followed me. Unfortunately, she never kept her tail down and she caught the wire. I've never heard such a dog make such a noise in all my life. She howled and screeched, shot past me at 100 miles an hour, and went, went down the field. I never saw her for two hours. After that, she kept the tail down. There's not many times in farming that I wish I had a mobile phone. So there is a couple, just for the camera. On the last lecture, I said we had pigs. And they're lovely animals to look at. They were clean, very comical, especially when the baby. And I put a photograph of Lucy. She was the name of the sow. She had 17 piglets, and Marion stayed all night, up all night, to make sure she farrowed on her. So that's all I did was give her a board, so when the pig pushes a, a little pig piglet out, you pick the piglet up and you put it on the sow's teeth, but you make sure the board is between the head and you, because you didn't know how they'd react. But so, um, Lucy was marvellous, lovely sow. Anyway, down in Pembroke, we were down farming there. And we had a run to the litter. So she was destined now for the deep freeze. The other, she had about 15 that time. Anyway, the other 14 had gone to market. And this run now was put in a shed on her own, fed, model coddle. Boys used to play with her. And she was getting now to well over poker size, so she was due to go into the deep freeze. It doesn't sound very nice the way I say it, but that's like. Anyway, one morning I was milking and three cows came in and their quarters had been sucked. So I was thinking perhaps I got a molly cow and that's a cow that sucks another cow. So what you do then is put the leather harness on, on the cow that's sucking the other cow and you put six inch nails in it facing out. So when she goes to suck another cow, the nails stick in the other cow and she won't stand to be sucked. Anyway, there was nothing in the evening. The cows were all fine after the evening milking. So 10 o'clock that night, I went to have a walk in the cubicles, but it was, must have been October time. And the cows were in on November. So I walked quietly up the cubicles. And by then at 10 o'clock, most of the cows have had a a belly full of food, and they were resting or sleeping and chewing their cud in the cube. So I came across this cow fast asleep, chewing its cud, and lo and behold, who should be flat out in the cubicle next to it was this runt of a pig with a cow's teeth in its mouth, and every now and again, just like a baby, to grunt and start sucking again. And the expression on his face was pure joy and contentment. But, uh, that was killed within two days. Never got out of the shed before he went to market. So that stopped that problem. 
तो या वर ट्रांसफायर काम रहन चेक न फोटोग्राफर बात आते का करे मेरे बिन मन या बात फोटोग्राफर को भी न यूनी या द टाइम आई वाज डाउन इन माय ड्रीम एंड अ बिग फ्रेंड ऑफ माइन ही बॉट द फार्म डाउन देयर वी वॉक्ड इट टुगेदर एंड इट वाज माय वीकेंड ऑन and uh, he had sheep there heavily heavy pregnant and they were also rearing pheasants there for a shoot and the uh, people in charge of the pheasants you know they've nothing to the farm but uh, it was used there so i go down and feed the sheep saturday and sunday morning and check everything was all right and the pheasants would soon come to know that you were feeding the sheep you get six or seven come to get take their share Anyway, there was one ewe there. She was very, very heavy and lamb, and very slow. She had triplets. So I'd keep enough feed back for her and a bit more, and I'd walk towards the hedge, waiting for her to come down to join. And this cock pheasant followed me. So it was me and this pheasant now waiting for this ewe to come through. She came through. I put the feed, bit of the feed down for her, and there was the cock pheasant pecking the ewe's head. I was trying to send the pheasant away with my boot, but it was back and forth for a while, and that was comical. So there the ewe was trying to eat the pheasant peck in its head. Yeah, you know, we were only about six inches apart, and those are memories. So that was comical. Any question? No. Working hours. What do you work on a farm? I can only speak personally, and my father was the same. Everybody's different, but you only get out of life what you put in. And if you do your best at all times, and as I said, you've got to have your routine right, your feed right. Because you're dealing with animals; they don't want to change your feed willy-nilly on any excuses. And when you milk in, you've got to try to keep the time between each milk in twelve hours. So I was up between five and half past five. I wanted the machines on by six o'clock, but it depended where the cows were. If they were out on grass and they were the far side of the farm, you got up earlier to get them in, get the machines on by six. And in the evening, then you'd be milking about five-ish, no earlier. Five, and that because the cows, you want them because those fresh calves, you know, they've got a lot to put up with the milk they produce. Eh? So the, if you say oh six hours and then uh, you know give it say an extra if you didn't start milking till nine o'clock, their udders would be so tight it would be uncomfortable for them. So it wasn't right. You look after. The animals look after you. You look after the animals. The cows comes always came first, and that was, there was no arguments as far as I'm concerned. You'd have breakfast then. Depends whether it's like in the winter you'd have breakfast about quarter to nine. In the summer it depends whether the cows went out to grass. But it was half past nine the time you came back. If you were working around the yard, you had a coffee at eleven o'clock. Dinner half past twelve, and I always took an hour for dinner. The only time that never happened it was a cow calving, or we were on the silage and finishing the field. But then I could have about twenty minutes sleep, and then you done the jobs in the afternoon. You were either fencing, we done all the building work myself, we fencing myself, and anything else we done ourselves. But we had a lot of money borrowed at the time, so you couldn't afford to pay somebody. We're on with it. It wasn't a problem. Very enjoyable. Especially with the dog, and if the dog dog had a couple of hands, they would have been very useful. But he was a lovely animal too. See, and then you uh, come in about quarter past four, have a cup of tea, and then if you were on your own, which I was for a while, you'd be out then quarter of an hour later, start feeding the calves, and put everything ready for milking. Then you'd milk, and then Marion would scrape out, and we'd bed down. I'd give the silage feed up. We were in the bath for seven. The only time that changed was in the spring, from March to April. Well, towards the end of February to the end of March, depending on the weather, you were out on the field. You were fertilizer out. You were chain harrowing. You were rolling the field. But I never worked later than ten. 
Only if we're on the silage and we're coming to an end of a field for another 20 minutes, the field was finished, we carried on. Then you had 140 cows, they were calving all the year round. And 70%, 75% of the cows were calve in the night. It's nature. It was safer in the night than in the day in the wild. And you check the cow, go and check after milk in, you see the cow, you go out at 10 o'clock, you put your hands on her, check her, then you'd have an idea, you'd say, oh, she's going to calve between 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, you had experience by now. So if it was 2 or 3 o'clock, I'd go to bed. If it was before 12, I'd stay in the chair. And then you'd go out and you just make sure everything was right. Or if you wanted assistance, you helped her. And you learned a lot, you know, you, you taught yourself on the vet. I had a good vet when we were in Savinio. Uh, if you showed interest, he'd take time to show you. My father had a cow with wire in the stomach. And he said, boy, come here, in Welsh, that was. And he said, on the left-hand side, from behind the cow is the stomach, right-hand side is the wood. He said, put your ear to the left-hand side, and you hear a ping in, in the, in the stomach, and there's four stomachs to a cow. And that was the wire. So she had to have an operation to take the wire out. And the, what was the name after that? Operation. So you, in the middle of the night then, especially on the winter when all the frost was down and that, you'd go out, say, two o'clock in the morning. The first thing you do is look up, because you could put your hand up and reach all the stars, the Milky Way, the bear, the plough. It was a lovely, you know, you always spent a couple of minutes looking at the sky. And you said a few thanks to the, the higher up, and then you went to see the cow. So that was, and you know, you still got up at uh, five, up at five in the morning. But you, you were self-employed, you could adjust what you were doing. And the same as everybody else, I got fed up sometimes, I had a day. So me and Susie then would walk the boundary and walk through the field to see if everything was all right. And when you're growing grass, your pH has got to be between six, six and a half and seven. Otherwise, the grass can't utilize the fertilizer properly, so you're wasting money. And anybody who knows me well, I don't like waste. So, you know, you just look. And you think, and the, the ground will tell you what it needs. And when we bought the last farm, there was one field there. I could grow a good crop two feet high, three feet high in the middle of the field. For 50 yards all the way around, I couldn't grow any grass. So I got calcified the seaweed. And I put that on. It was a different field after that. So the farmer before me didn't want to take muck down there. And I didn't use slurry. Only a small, very, what, 5% of the cow's waste went to slurry. The rest went to solids. And while we, I'll talk about that with the slurry, it, yes, there is a smell with it. And I had a sprinkler system on the farm where the dirty water went through the sprinkler system. And anyway, you're supposed to move it every 12 hours. I don't know what happened, but I didn't move it one day. And when I went to move it the following day, there were 16 buzzards all around the sprinkler. I turned it off now. All around the sprinkler. But the dirty water on the slurry takes the oxygen out of the top surface of the soil and kills the worms. So all the 16 buzzards all around eating the worms. So as far as I'm concerned, slurry should never have been allowed. It should be solid manure. And this year's manure, the waste from the cow, should never be used till the following year. It should be allowed to, to uh, break down. And when you put that on the ground, it's slow release uh, phosphate and potash and a bit of nitrogen. And the worms have got time to pull it into the ground. It improves the soil. With there's so much water and there's so much water in the slurry, you haven't got your system right. You see a lot of farmers, I know what you have, going along the road, pumping slurry over the hedge. And I know a few instances where at 12 o'clock at night, uh, shall we say, um, they alter the flow of the water to get rid of it. So, but you know, that's all got to be looked at. If the job's going to be done, it's got to be done properly. 
And the family farmer was a better farmer for the environment and the wildlife. You know, we used to enjoy watching the skylark. They fly up and be singing. You don't hear that anymore. Because now it's silage. You're doing the silage any time from the 1st of May to the end of May. Well, the birds are nested. They laid their eggs. And if they've if they hatched, the grass is cut. So they killed off. The only time you see skylarks now is in on wild meadow or on side verges where they've learned. But they've been reduced in number. And as a family, we love the wildlife. And we still do in the garden here. We've got the three or four pigeons come in. They've got names. If one used to feed out to your hand, but he's dead now. He had lost him about six months ago. His wife still comes, maybe she was there. So, you know, the as a family, it's memories. You take photographs of the grandchildren feeding the pigeon on their hand. You know, and the uh, robin then waiting for you to open the back doors. So you can feed him with a bit of fat pull to feed his young in the spring. You know, you watch and look at nature. You can learn a lot. And it's lovely. Any question? Of course, it's going well, isn't it? I haven't got long to go on. Right. I was buying cows in the 80s for between 300 and 600 pounds. Barren prices were anywhere between 250 and 400 pounds. And by a barren, I mean a barren milking cow that's gone wrong. And it depends how much meat on them, because a milking cow works extremely hard. And I take my hat off to them. And they've got to be really looked after. And uh, I had, we used to name a lot of the cows. I had one named Mangi after Marion's mother. But she liked the cake. She used to eat a lot of cake. And it's cake that we fed the cows in the parlour. So she was Mangi. And she was a lovely lady as well. The other one was a friend of Marion's. Well, that's what we say. Um, I won't say her name. But I had a cow there with a smaller dirt, and she was named after Marion's friend. You know, it, it was a laugh. Um, where was I? Baroness. A cow, a, a female heifer, we call them, is a female milk producer that hasn't been put to calf. And you, you, there's a, a lot of ways you rear these calves for replacement milking cows. And they should calve down from two years to two and a half years, no, no longer than two and a half. Because they grow too much and they put less into, the, into their productive parts. And so if you can get three or four lactations out of a cow, so that's Say four lactations, four years, the two year olds calving, they're only six. And the average age for culling the cows, if you can get eight calves out of a cow, you've done very well. So they're working extremely hard. I can't express that more. What are the causes for the cows going ill, barren cows? There's three main causes mastitis, and that's an information in the other. Lameness, so they're walking, they're on their feet all the time, on concrete, and fertility. You can't get them back in calf. So the ideal is one calf a year, working for 10 months milking, two months off to rest. But whatever you feed a milking cow in August, if you don't do it right, you will have problems in January and February. So it's ongoing all the time with cattle. And it's important to get it right. Must like this. If you've got clean cubicles, clean bedding, dry and plenty of air, you will have less silage. I used to roll every field after the cows have been on the grass. Now they're worried about compaction. But if you look at it, those crows, if you see them eating the grass, they put their tongue around a bunch of grass and pull, and it snaps off. And I was told by my uncle oh, 60 years ago now, 
He said, look, boy, that route has been loosened. You take a light roller over it, you know, a one or a two ton roller. What does that do? It pushes the roots down so they can get the nutrients, the grass can grow back quicker. Also, a cow does a lot of time spending a penny out on the field and you've got cow pads everywhere. Now, and if you roll that field straight after the cows are finished, grazing, you'll spread that muck and the grass will come back even. A cow won't eat for about six months where, where it's muck. But if you spread it across the field, it'll eat it all because you're not tainted. So, and also in the summer, on a dry summer, if those fields weren't relatively flat, when a cow lay down or got up, it could easily scratch the end of its teeth. If it scratched the end of its teeth, you will have the sight in. So that was one. Lameness. Any cow that came through the parlor, I had a system, they had to go out through a race. And if a cow was lame coming in to be milked, she was held in the cattle crush, and as soon as milking was over, I'd go and treat her, see what was wrong, and put her right. And that was important, because we've all had bad feet, or most of us. If you've got bad feet, you are finished. You can't walk long distances, you can't graze, you can't eat, but they're talking about the cows now. So that is your problem. So it's very important to get your tracks right, your concrete has got to be right. And then you've got a chance. So you look after the cow. And when you dry them off, I used to give them a bolus. You could put a bolus with this contraption straight into the stomach. And that would be, contain magnesium, calcium, and a lot of trace elements. So the time that cow came to calf two months later, or thereabouts, it was ideal. Sometimes it was longer, sometimes it was shorter. Um, she normally calved and then she wouldn't retain her afterbirth. If she retains her afterbirth, you put pessaries in the womb, and then you have a discharge, and it takes longer for her to come into the cycle so she can be put in calf. So those are the fertility, getting a cow back in calf. These high producing cows and pedigree cows, they're difficult to get in calf if you've got the system wrong. So they're doing a hell of a lot of work and their body is drained. So you've got to do it. You know, and I've known, um, well, I milked for a friend not far from here. He's got very good pedigree cattle. And it was a problem to get some of them in calf all the time. But uh, with us, we use AI on the best cows. And then I had a bull then for everything, everything else. And I said the incidents with the bull last time. So it's a problem. Um, If you've got a fertility problem, you can end up having one calf every 18 months. Well, your costs then are increased. So it's all important. It's about doing the job properly. Right. Any questions? No. Where are we? The problem today I mentioned, you're not proved. If you're a small producer, nobody wants to pick your milk up. If you're a medium producer, sometimes they'll charge you to pick your milk up. Now let's talk about welfare, animal welfare. Animal welfare standards in this country are high. They're probably the best in the world. Not every farmer is a good man. And you got that in all walks of life, whether you're, you know, Whatever it is, there's the good, the very good, the good, and the indifferent, and the odd problem first. As I said before, you look after your cattle, they will look after you, because they paid your bill. So welfare was important. When people get involved, and they don't understand the farming principle, or done it on a big scale, I'll give you an example. And this isn't very nice, but I'll tell you it. A lorry taking calves export to France. The French won't buy anything made in Britain or the produce of Britain, will they? So if you live export these cattle and calves, because they use a lot of veal out in the lowlands, you take them out alive, 
when they have put on the table and as veal, it's produce of France. Yeah, not pretty. So they sell. Bull calves in 1991 or somewhere around there were making Frisian bull calves. They haven't got a lot of meat on them. We're making between 80 and 100 pounds at three weeks of age. This lorry was carrying the calves down to Dover, broke down. A film star or the television people got involved on the paper saying about cruelty and everything else. There should have been a contingency plan. It's not a problem. If a lorry breaks down, these lorries were designed with side panel shoe, side panel doors. The driver, an empty lorry up along it, drop the panels so they can move the calves across. Is there a problem with them being on the lorry too long? Yes. We'll have a holding station down near the ports, offload the calves. A farmer can do it as a business. And those selling the calves will pay anything up to 10 pound a head for them to be looked after before loaded back on the lorry. It's not a problem. What happened? Cruelty to animals, everything else. So the export of these Frisian bull calves was stopped. The price of year tagging and everything else feeding them for three weeks, taking them to market, instead of having 80 to 120 pounds, you ended up having three pounds per calf. Now any business has got to make money. So what was happening? When you were having Frisian bull calves then, they were shot, they were mainly shot, and taken to the Nakaman or taken to the kennels to be fed for dog food, which isn't very pleasant. And that was caused with poor knowledge. They should have looked at it. It wasn't. It could have been overcome the problem. You know, jump up in the air, shout, and see what you see without understanding. Why are calves, baby calves, fed on their own? They kept on the cow or fed fed colostrum milk for three days. That colostrum milk is the immunity from the cow from the dam to the the calf. They're making a fuss. You see these white little kennels in the fields with one calf penned in alongside them, got about six feet of room. Why is that? If you put 10 calves together, it's the same as a uh, youngster. You'll have some who are bullying the rest and eat more than the rest, and there's one or two who won't get their share, so they'd be poor doers. So there's things like that you've got to look at. And that's why we always reared them for the first six to eight weeks on their own as individuals. Occasionally, there'll be two in a pen, but, but they all got fed properly, they grew, and they grew well. You didn't have any poor to work. So that's why. Any questions? Uh, Mike? Yes, I'm running out of time again. Yes, thank you. Mike? Question, yes. question Mike? Yeah? In your first, when you first started, you mentioned these massive farm uh, in Carmarthen, was it, or North Wales? 3,000 cows. Right. Yeah, uh, he's farming three miles west of Kamar then. Yeah. Now then he also said that you had to separate the calves because uh, if they were with the with the adult cattle, they would die or the the fumes would kill them. Yeah. So well, how do they do how do these massive farms then deal with that? That's the first question. And the second thing is you talked about slurry. Why is yeah. it if, if it if it is not a good pro, uh, a good practice? Why do so many farmers use it? Well, do the slurry first, John. You're only yeah. supposed to put so so much so many liters out per acre of slurry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you there are machines that you can put the slurry out and it's put directly in the ground, but it costs a lot more money to do. Right. And let's put it this way: there's no brief policing. How much slurry you put out? You can, I can. You can see if you're in the business, you'll see. Well, that's too heavy. When it pours to rain, you get runoff. And where does the runoff end up? In the river. In the river. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, that, that's that's a pet hit of mine. The other question on this chap uh, milking three thousand cows. I'm not sure what he does there, but I should imagine he's not daft. When the cow calves, the we used to keep the calf on the cow. Still milk the cow after the calf had sucked. Go and milk the cow, then put it back with the calf for three days. So it'd have his colostrum. 
The modern way now is you can, you, can, uh, you can milk these cows at a calf, you test the milk for if they got good colostrum, and you freeze it, and then you bottle feed the calves and take the calf off the cow straight away. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. those calves then are reared in a different shed, John, not the same air. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Or they take them to another farm to be reared away from that farm. And that's where I'm saying these small, these family farms, they're packing up milk in, and some of them are, are taking these calves and rearing them, you know, at so much ahead. Yeah. But it's all changing. Yeah. And you can't mix, as I said, if you put a young cattle in adult cattle's air, air area, you will get pneumonia. Guarantee that. Yeah. I put, uh, put a thousand pounds on it. Uh, David, any more? Um, if anyone would like to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions, please. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. I, I get my milk delivered. I, I get milk delivered and I pay, it's 81 pence a pint. How much of that does the farmer get? The farmer will get anywhere between 27 and 31 pence a litre, depending who he sells for. This country has always been renowned that it wants liquid milk, and it's not fussy about the rest. It'll uh, buy in to uh, import other stuff. We only produce 70% what we need in this country. And if all the world produced milk like they do in Wales and uh, parts of England off grass, there's 180 odd billion milking cows in the world, if that's the figure right. If they all produced it like we do in this country, it'll reduce numbers down to about 80 billion worldwide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your margins, Margaret, are too small. <coughs> you can't be, you're in, you're in business to make money. Not the, but farming is unique. You've got to look after the environment. You so the rest, the, mm -hmm. the rest, the rest of it goes on administration and delivery. Well, it goes to the processor and who's ever selling the milk. Mm. You know, if you're buying yeah. direct from yeah. a farm, there's one in uh, near Sengenek. Yes, a guy Trevach is selling the milk there in bottles, a pound of milk a pint and a vending machine just before you get to the motorway. He's always um, selling as well um, milkshakes. And uh, he's doing very well. Mm -hmm. And the reason he started that up was because uh, he couldn't have a milk buyer for his milk. And he was milking 200 mm -hmm. cows. Next time. Mm -hmm. Oh, in, a, in the viable world of far dairy farming, Mike, what would be a viable herd to have a decent standard of living for a farmer? Well, you've got to be close to four to five hundred now, Dave, and it's rising. So, you know, is, is it rising because the profit margin is getting smaller? It's getting smaller. The processors don't want to send the lorry to, to pick somebody with only a hundred cows. You know, in the in the eighties when I went on my own, we were milking seventy cows and had hundred breeding ewes. Mm -hmm. You know, we done all right, and um, it was twenty two and a half pence a liter per, uh, of the milk then, and that was with the MMB, and that the demise of the MMB was the demise of the milking farm, the dairy farm. You know, they're pushing the margins there. Mm. You know, when you got about, uh, instead of having eight or nine, ten pence a litre margin, now you're down to one, two pence. And dairy farming is capital intensive. But you've got your milking parlour, and I milked in a, in a breast parlour. That was, um, we had six units, eight cows in. I converted a cow shed myself one winter. And then the second parlour, I had a 12, 12 herringbone. I was in the pit. I was milking 12, I could milk 12, well, I was milking 12 cows at the time. You put the machine on and you go around. Then you start singing to them or talking to them. 
And the worst cows you could get, they have just on the side. Yeah. The smaller the cows, the more bad tempered they are. <laughs> and a friend of mine who was farming said, doesn't that apply to the ladies as well? But I couldn't answer him because my wife's only five feet. <laughs> I thought it's safer. Well, that's true. <laughs> the bigger the animal, the bigger the animal, generally the more docile they are. I know it's strange. How tall are you, Michael? Pardon? How tall are you, Michael? Well, uh, about five foot eleven and eleven or five foot eleven. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, yes, taller the other more docile. That's, that's the right. male side, John. That's the male side. Females are talking about. I had one little cow. She always watched me putting the machine on. She wouldn't eat a cake, and I tell her to behave. And uh, she was she was good as gold, but she wouldn't uh, eat a cake. I put the machines on, but she turned her head and watched me till I done it. Mm. But they're all different. They've all got feelings. They've all got personalities. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It was a joy. It was never worked. It was pure joy. Good. Great. Yeah. Right. If, uh, if that concludes um, questions and answers, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mike for his um, you, wonderful talk again. Thank you. Thank you for putting up for me and thank you for your help, dear. That's perfectly all right. Um, in the next one is in uh, February. Um, February, he says. Second Wednesday. Yeah. Second Wednesday, yes. I'm just looking it up. Because the, the pestilence I'm tired of forgetting. The great, the great pestilence in Wales. Thank you. 1345, whatever it is. Um, and yes. it's in the evening, David, isn't it? It's in the evening at 7 30. Yeah. Uh, this is at the request of the people who are delivering it. Now you won't be getting a um I won't be setting up the Zoom link for that particular uh, one, uh, the people who are delivering the lecture are setting it up because of the way they want to do it and with the technical presentation that they'll be delivering. So it's easier if they set it up. It's a dramatic one, isn't it? They're doing it like it's a drama? Like, like a drama, yes. Yeah. And yeah. there will be a 10 minute recess in the middle of it so you can all scurry away and get hot drinks and little tubs of ice cream and <laughs> peanuts so you can flick them at the person in front of you and that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> Can I, can I just say, can I just say, I'm sorry I disappeared just now. Did but you? It was, my, it was my local doctor's surgery to book us in for the vaccine on Monday. Oh, oh well, well done. done. Well done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well done. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and can I also say, I'll never think of my bowl of cornflakes in the morning when I pour the milk and I put a piece of beef in the oven. I'll think of you, Mike, every time. Thank you. That's all I'd say with the food is, you look what's in the food, because bread, there's fillers put in. I was going to talk about polyphosphates and hypochlorite in chickens and other food, but perhaps that's another time. Yeah. It's a very interesting subject, because you don't know half what goes in your food. Milk is genuine. Yeah. 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 And then can you mention, David, about uh, the, the lecture, the, the, the fourth uh, Wednesday. Wednesday of next month, yeah it's poetry please and the idea is that if you have a favorite poem or one or two that uh you find really interesting or you enjoyed uh then if you'd be willing to share that poem on our poetry please um sarah Jew will be hosting that um and so if you have a poem or two or one you've written yourself that you'd like to share on that then uh then if you'd like to share it, that that's what that uh, time is about. All right. So and that will be and that will be um, delivered uh, at our normal time of two o'clock on that Wednesday. Yes, yeah. so it will. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, Dave. What, what date? What date is that? The fourth Wednesday. The fourth Wednesday. Yes. The fourth Wednesday. Yes. The twenty-fourth of February, yes. yeah, of February yeah. Margaret. If that, Thank you very much, Dave. You're very welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for an interesting Thank talk. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, can, I can have my sleep now. Uh, you can, <laughs> yes. And may all of you stay safe. Thank you for putting up with me again. But stay safe. Look after yourself, please. Yeah, okay, yeah. Mike. Thank yeah. you, Mike.